And let's just start reading from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, verse 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in the salvation your Son has wrought. Father, you thought it, the Son brought it, and the Spirit has wrought it in our hearts. And we thank you, Father, that we can say who know him, we have got it. And so we thank you for this wonderful salvation that is found in you alone. Now take your word, we pray, and may thy name be glorified. May the name of Jesus be exalted. We pray for souls tonight, for the souls that will see the danger. And Lord, that souls of men and women who have been redeemed will see that which they have been saved from and rejoice with gladness at the goodness of God. Glorify your Son and glorify his name. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Amen. Just this week, Donald Tusk of the European Union, he said these words, I quote him, I've been wondering what that special place in hell looks like for those who promoted Brexit without a sketch of a plan how to carry it out safely. His friend in the European Union, Guy Vorhofstadt, he then replies to him, well, I doubt Lucifer would welcome them as after what they did to Britain, they would even manage to divide hell. And then Professor John D. Buer from Queen's University in Belfast, he then replies to that also saying this, special place in hell for no deal the Brexiteers, hell is too good for them. Got me thinking on hell. Do they understand what hell means? Do they know Oh, what hell entails to say such a thing about anyone? Who is going to hell? So that's the title. So who's going to hell? So who's going to hell? Are you? Are you? Notice here, being a Brexiteer without a plan, whoever says it or thinks it whether Brexiteer or a Remainer does not qualify you for heaven. Brexiteer or Remainer does not either qualify you for hell. What qualifies a man and a woman for heaven is that they've trusted in the finished work of Christ. And that which qualifies a man and a woman for hell is their fallen sinful nature and their rejection of the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what qualifies a person for either. So it got me thinking on hell. Here are four inescapable truths about hell as we know it, as is about hell fire, if I can put it that way. First of all, it is a place of torment. It is a place of torment. Secondly, it lasts forever. That lasts forever. Thirdly, there is no escape. There is no escape. And fourthly, you didn't need to go there. Or you tonight don't have to go there. 
It is a place of torment. It lasts forever. There's no escape. You don't need to go there. So who's going to hell then? Who's going to hell? In verse 14 of our reading, we see the great white throne judgment after the millennium reign of our Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Then we see the great white throne judgment in verse 14 of Revelation 20. Notice what it says. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now we must be careful here. You're going to hear things maybe you have never heard before. You're going to understand things that you've maybe never understood before. Because our mentality is, well, everyone who dies unsaved goes automatically to a lake of fire. Scriptures don't tell us that. They don't tell us that. Let me ask you a question. Hell here in Revelation 20 and verse 14 If it be a burning place of torment which lasts forever as our mind has told us and as we have heard, if it be that, then how is it that it is taken out and it is cast into a burning lake of fire? A lake of fire put into a lake of fire surely makes a bigger lake of fire. Let me ask you another question. If the eternal burning, tormenting flame of hell is here in Revelation 20 and verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. If it be that, and it's cast into a lake of fire, and this is the second death, then is that the death of hell? But there's a burning lake of fire. So we must understand what we're thinking and what we're speaking about. Notice this. And death and hell were cast into a lake of fire. This is the second death. Look at verse 13, the verse before. It says this, And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Here's another question we must ask ourselves this evening. If hell is an eternal, tormenting lake of fire, I need you to stay with me now, and it is taken up and people are taken out of it, Are they judged at the great white throne judgment to be put into another lake of fire? Is that what the Bible's telling us? But rather, you see, there's more to this scripture than meets the eye. We'll look at it in a moment. We must be careful. It says here at the great white throne judgment that not only is death and hell cast into the lake of fire, we're told that this is the second death. This is the second death. Now notice this, if you will. There are two schools of thought which we must show you and show you the, uh, if I can call it, the dangers of them. And I want you to be aware of them. If this lake of fire cancels out a tormenting, burning hell, it doesn't make sense that it's in another lake of fire, a tormenting hell. And what we must look at is one of the teachings that has come out of this second death is this a teaching called ultimate reconciliation ultimate reconciliation means that this fire is a place of purification now stay with me this is important it is a place of purification of souls who rejected christ all their life And Revelation chapter 19 and Revelation chapter 20 speaks of all those who are going into the lake of fire, even the devil himself. And ultimate reconciliation says that even the devil will have a purification and will be eventually saved and redeemed again. The scriptures don't teach that. I want to let you know in CET, we do not believe that. So we must be careful and understand exactly what's happening here. Another teaching is what's known as conditional immortality or annihilation. Conditional immortality or annihilation. And this is what it means, that these souls are put into a lake of fire for whatever period of time, whether it be, I don't know, it's meant to be one year or 50,000 years, we don't know. But they believe that they will eventually die and will cease to exist while those of us 
who are in Christ will live forever. So they're out of their tormenting pain, which means that the lake of fire, the eternal burning place of damnation, loses its uh, very ethos, its very attribute of what it's meant to be. So we must be careful. We do not believe that in CET either. We do not believe that here either. So what we must do this evening, so who's going to hell? Let's take a look at it. For example, there are three main words for hell in the original Hebrew and Greek text. Three main words. There's actually four words, but one is only used once in the New Testament in Second Peter of the angels who fell or left their first estate. The fallen angels are left in Tartarus. They're held in some place of darkness. That's only used once in the New Testament, so we'll not use that tonight. The three words stay with me because I want to show you examples of them before we come to this, and then you can understand about this word hell. The first in the Old Testament uh, that is mainly used is the word for hell is Sheol. Sheol. And this is what it means. It means the realm. The realm of the dead. The netherworld. It means a subterranean level. In other words, under the earth. It means the grave. The pit. The grave and the pit. Let me give you a couple of examples. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The word grave is the word sheol, which is the word hell. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He brings down to the grave. He brings to hell. The grave is hell here. I'm sure there are maybe some of you who are farmers. I don't know. I know there's a few farmers. I don't know whether you're dairy farmers or cattle, or I don't know what you call them. I'm a Belfast boy, so. But those farmers that dig the spuds, you know. And you know, there's a term for spuds under the ground. It's called helling of the potatoes. <coughs> Who's ever heard of that? Nobody's ever heard of that. Look it up. It's called helling the potatoes when the potatoes are put into the ground. Helling the potatoes. And notice here in Psalm First, Second Samuel 26 and verse 2. Here's another example. It says, David says, and it's also in Psalm 18 and verse 5. He says, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Do you know what he's saying here? The sorrows of Sheol, the sorrows of the grave. In other words, I was almost at the point of death to be laid in the grave, to enter into that netherworld or darkness. That's what it means here. It's the word hell here, Sheol. The snares of death prevented me. One more for this word in the Old Testament, Psalm 16 and verse 10. The Apostle Peter uses it, speaking of the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2 and verse 27. Listen to what he says. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The word hell is the word sheol that is also grave. So in the prophetic here, David is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and he goes to the grave, laid in a tomb. He goes into death, right into the realms and the regions of the death. Now, if my memory serves me right, in the Apostles' Creed, in the eighth line, it says Jesus went to hell. The idea there is now some people have taken this word hell and they think that for three solid days Jesus was under the wrath of God in hell, burning in flames. Friend, now that is not right. The wrath of God was poured upon him in its completeness and in its fullness when he hung and bled and died in Calvary. And so we have, and I'm sorry to say, but so we have 
many word of faith preachers who are now saying that Jesus went to hell, he was tormented, and he was born again. Blasphemy. He is the almighty God. He is the pure, sinless, spotless lamb. He carried our sins away to the grave, and they're buried there forever, and he rose again the third day victorious over it all. That's the Christ we serve. The full wrath of God was on the cross. He did not need to be born again because he is the Holy One of Israel. Understand here, these uh, doctrines that are coming out are coming out and they, some of them are off hell itself. Jesus bore the fullness of the wrath of God that you and I should bear. Did you hear that, friend? I want you to understand the Christian. Listen to it anew. You might say, well, I know that. Well, listen to it afresh. Let the Spirit minister to you into your spirit tonight. If you're a born-again believer, listen, Jesus bore the full penalty that was against you on the cross, not in a burning hell. And if you're not saved, he bore it for you. And if you don't accept him as your savior, then you'll bear your own sin before him. And notice this. We're told that he says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Sheol, or the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The holy one was the, the son of God, the man Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know why Jesus was raised the third day? Does anybody know why? I'll tell you why. Because they believed that four days, corruption set into the body. And four days with the heat, the corruption would start, and they would start to stink. Remember Lazarus was dead, and the sisters come out to meet the Lord and says, Lord, Master, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. And he says, uh, he says, take me to the tomb and to move away the stone. I'm paraphrasing for time's sake. And they say, but Master, he's dead four days now, and he stinketh. In other words, he's four days gone, He's in the state of corruption. Lazarus stinks. Well, just as the spirit of prophecy spoke of Jesus, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He didn't make it to the fourth day because the Father raised him on the third. Amen. Father raised him on the third day. What a savior you and I serve. So that's the Old Testament shield. There's many, many of them. I just picked those uh, just to speak on this evening. Secondly, the word hell in the New Testament. That was the old and now the new. The word for hell in many of the occasions in the New Testament is the word Hades. That's the English rendering of it. Hades or Hadas is the Greek. Hades is the English. And notice this. It's the corresponding word, the New Testament Greek corresponding word to the Old Testament Hebrew language. So we have Sheol in the Old Testament Hebrew, and we have Hades in the New Testament Greek, and they mean the same thing. Let me give you some examples that hell or Hades is the same as Sheol, the realm of death and darkness, the grave, in other words. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says. And we'll all know this verse off by heart. He says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus isn't saying that the gates of eternal flames will not prevail against it. He's not even meaning that the very demons of hell will prevail against it as we think. You know what he's saying? Even though my people or my church, the ecclesia or the ecclesia, the called out believing ones, even though they're going to go through trial and tribulation, even into the grave, They'll not stop my church being built. And they've done it right through it all, the persecution, all through all those Roman dictators the whole way through. And they cried, it's Christ for me. Heal Christ. They went to the grave and there's coming a day whenever their body will be raised again incorruptible. Amen. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Here's another one to look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, speaking of the resurrection of the dead at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, 
You know what the word grave is in the Greek New Testament? It's the same as hell. Oh, grave, oh, hell. Oh, Hades. Where is your victory? There's going to come a time when Jesus comes and the graves are going to be opened. They're going to be opened and the sea is going to bring together every, even if the fish have eaten it over the years and it's turned to small, and, uh, uh, unseeable DNA. The Lord is going to call every single one that was lost in the fires of Smithfield and those at the fires that were burned at the stake. The Lord's going to call the very bodies together and the graves are going to open and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Listen, and we will say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Listen, see, when I enter death, I know that I belong to Christ. I know I belong to him. I know when I die, I don't die in hopelessness. When I enter into, listen, get me right now, I want to say this, understand the word, I will enter through Jesus' tarry into hell, that is, into the grave, but my spirit will go to be with the Father. And listen, there's coming a time when he comes back again, he will raise me up, and I will be like him. And so will you if you're saved. I won't die in hopelessness, I die in the fullness of hope that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, there's nothing as sad, there's nothing as sorrowful, there's nothing as tragic as when I am standing at the graveside or in a church or wherever it is and I'm looking at a loved one who has died and the hopelessness that is around the coffin when the family are looking and have rejected Christ all their life and I am looking for words of comfort to say that I may stay true to the gospel, yet comfort the people and I'm struggling to say something. Because I died without Christ. <coughs> and we bury them in the grave. And we must leave them at his mercy. What a way to go. What a way to go. It is good to know that when we leave this scene of time, that we are absent from the body. We are to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Friend, are you saved tonight? Are you saved? What if it was you? What if some of your family asked me to bury them? It was you. What would I say? Do you see when you're burying a saint who's went on with God? Do you see when you know someone who has loved the Lord Jesus Christ? When they have trusted in the blood of Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sin and you're standing and there's a sorrowing family just the same. Oh, I know what to say. I know how to cheer. And in fact, I know what to preach. Because this one belonged to him. What about you? What about you? I think we're getting an understanding of this word hell. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, Hades. In the grave have died without hope, without Christ. Oh, Hades, where is thy victory, says the Christian. The coming of Christ. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, the risen Lord Jesus says this, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He doesn't have the keys of a burning, fiery hell. He's not saying that because there is no keys of a burning, fiery hell. He said, I have the keys of the realms and the regions of the darkness of death and the grave. I was dead and now I'm alive. Because we live, he lives, we shall live also who are in him. That's what he's saying here. Once a man and a woman are in the burning, fiery hell, we'll look at it in a moment. Once a man and a woman find themselves there, there is no escape. There's no turning back. In Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. 
A friend of you died tonight. I know it's a somber. Where would you be? How would you stand? Where would you spend eternity? So with this in mind, let's look at our reading then. That's our introduction to this reading. Let's look at it. Revelation 20 and verse 13 says, And death and hell, death and Hades, the grave, the grave and the dead who are in the grave, at the second resurrection. See, when Jesus comes, is the resurrection of those who are dead in Christ and those who are still alive when he returns. It's the first resurrection. And then we have a millennium reign, and then at the end of that reign, there's going to be a, a second resurrection to the great white throne judgment. You want to make sure you're in the first resurrection, brother, sister, friend. You want to make sure that you're in the first resurrection, not the second. Death and hell, or Hades, the grave, were delivered up which were in them. Verse 14 says, And death and Hades, the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So now I think you understand what it's meaning here. The realms of the dead. The unsaved who have died outside of Christ. The grave itself and death will take no more people. It will be taken and cast into the lake of fire. That is the hellfire. The third word for hell is Gehenna. Hell fire, it means. Gehenna fire. Notice Gehenna was a, a, an actual literal place outside Jerusalem. And it was a garbage dump. And outside there they took the dead animal carcasses and the offal and they took the innards and the guts and all of the bones that were left at the, the very sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. Even some of the, uh, the, the criminals that were, that were uh, killed for, for their crimes, they took a lot of their bodies down. They brought it outside the city walls to the valley of Hinnom. Now in that valley, in the Old Testament, and we're not going to tonight, in the Old Testament, that's where they used to worship Moloch. Moloch was the god of fire. Moloch was the god where they made the brazen uh, bull god like this, and they used to boil their babies alive to satisfy the lusts of this god. Until the king of Israel uh, caused a cease it to cease and became a garbage dump. And all the dump of the city was there. And listen, it was a, li a light day and night, and it burned 24-7. It was called Gehenna. It was called Gehenna. In that fire, and around there were the, the bodies that were not yet consumed by the fire. They ended up with the heat of the day, and the flies and the swarms, they were consumed with worms, with maggots, which bored holes through the dead flesh, of all that was there and the rubbish that was there, and they lived there in masses in it. And the fire continues to burn. It is this that Jesus takes and uses it as a fitting description of hellfire. Will you turn with me to Mark chapter 9, please? Mark chapter 9. In just a few verses, because... We couldn't go through it all for time's sake. Let your eye run down to verse 43. Mark 9, verse 43. And the Lord Jesus says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire. It shall never, never shall be quenched. Notice, the Lord says, if you have something that's offended, he calls it his hand or it could be an eye. The idea is, what is holding you back from going into life in Christ? Friend, who is holding you back? You know, I'd love, I'd love to know my sins are forgiven and I would love to know that I've been saved and I would love to give my life to Christ. But you know, I like this too much and I like that too much and my friends too much and my work colleagues too much and I'm worried too much about this one, that one and the other one and we can go through the whole shopping list and it takes you to hell. It takes you to hellfire. Jesus says, cut it from you. 
and enter into life now that you may enter into eternal life then. Cut it from your friend. Your friends won't stand with you when you stand before God. They'll stand on your own. And your friends won't help you when you're in hell fire. You'll be there on your own. Or you'll have company, but you'll feel it on your own. Hell is not a place to party. Hell is not a place where they're up having a drink, one and us. You know, you see them, oh, I'm sure he's having a drink in us. He is not indeed if he's died without Christ. So the word here for hell, fire, in verse 43 is Gehenna fire. Look at verse 44. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The worm dieth not. Jesus takes Gehenna outside a place of continual burning. A place of worms and maggots eating flesh. To give the idea of that gnawing feeling. Something eating at you. It's continual forever. And the Lord Jesus mentions this. This is the same Jesus everyone thinks is gentle Jesus meek and mild. He will never judge anyone. It's all love, love, love. This is the words of Christ himself. Now, I notice this, brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, notice this. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. See in verse 43, the Gehenna fire shall never be quenched. Now we have a worm that does not die. By the way, see the fire shall not be quenched. You know what the Greek word is for that? Shall not be quenched, asbestos. <laughs> That's where we get the word asbestos from. You know, people say, you have hands like asbestos, if you can lift something in this one. I say to Alison, you have hands like asbestos, she can hear lift stuff, stuff straight out of, the, uh, out of the oven. And I'm touching, going, ah, I'm crying like a, a big Jenny on, and she's lifting it and just setting it like this. I said, you have hands like asbestos. Where it's not quenched. It's like a place of asbestos surrounded in fire. A place engulfed with fire. The worm does not die. The fire is not quenched in verse 44. Verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. See, take it away from you. What's holding you back, friend? Friend, what's holding you back? Take it away from you. I'd love to get see a bot. There's no bots. There's no bots, but there's plenty of bots. There's plenty of only ifs and if I should have. That's right. That's right. In hellfire. Right. Notice this. And if thy, 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 if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter. Halt into life, having two feet, and to be cast into hellfire. The words of the Lord Jesus said that. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thine hand offend thee, pluck it out. If thine eye, pardon me, offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye. And having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I want to ask you again. I want to ask every one of you. I want to ask you if you're fallen away from Christ. I want to ask you, friend, what is worth going to hell for? Nothing. 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 Your friends are not worth it. Your boyfriends and your girlfriends, even your husbands and your wives holding you back from coming to Christ and receiving the fullness of his salvation and forgiveness is not worth going to hell for. The world is not worth it. Notice where the worm death not in the fire is not quenched. And this is a description of future punishment for all and every Christ rejecter. So who's going to hell then? Everyone who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. So who's going to hell then? Everyone who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
This description was given to our finite minds and our limited understanding by the Lord himself. That we might grasp the dreadful awfulness and horror with eternal, everlasting, never-ending torment and pain. And the warning is, don't go there. One must wonder what that never-dying worm would be. You ever think of that? We always hear about the hellfire. One must wonder what that never-dying worm would be. What about this for a never-dying worm? I should have listened. 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 Listen, forever and forever, gnawing in your conscience and in your mind, forever. Endeavor. I should have accepted Jesus. I should have accepted what he'd done, knowing forever and ever, but it's too late. It's too late. The worm of regret. Revelation chapter 19, please. Let's look at it. Revelation 19. Well, you know what? I can tell you, I don't know what it's like sitting down there. I don't know what it's like sitting in your seat, but I can tell you what it's like up here. God brings in. Oh, yeah, we can hear the other wee baby, and that's fine. We love your children. Don't you worry about them. Let me tell you what it's like up here. I can hear a holy hush. Because the reality of a lost soul, the Holy Ghost is speaking. Revelation 19. I want to show you your evil company, but you said that we'll be on our own. Oh, yes, no, you'll suffer it on your own. <laughs> but there's company according to the Bible. Revelation 19 and verse 20 here is the ungodly or evil hellfire company. 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. There's some company for you. There's some company. Revelation 20 and verse 10 continues. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tormented day and night forever and ever. There is some company for you. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Here is other company for you. But the fearful and unbelieving and, and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What company? What company? I'll tell you who else will be there. There'll be those who thought they were good enough. <coughs> There'll be those religious enough. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Speaking of this end time of the sheep to his right hand and the goats to the left. And just for the one verse, Matthew 25 and 41. More evil company. Listen to what it says. He says to them, the Lord Jesus says this. I pray you're not. You are not in this company. He says, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This fire wasn't prepared for you. It's prepared for the devil and for his angels. 
Verse 46. And these, the ones he says are cursed, go away into everlasting fire. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. How long is it? Everlasting. Friend, listen. It's everlasting. Please don't go there. Please. I beg of you. Don't go there. Please don't go there. Shall go away into everlasting punishment. Listen. But the righteous. But the righteous. Into life eternal. Now what does that mean the righteous? Does that mean someone like me. That I think that I'm it. (laughs) That I'm perfect. that, uh, That I do no wrong. That I'm some sort of wonderful person. Does not indeed. It means I'm saved by the grace of God. Trusting in Christ. And what Christ has done. His holiness. His righteousness is placed upon me. That's what it means. The, the word righteous here it gives the idea of one whose way of thinking, uh, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the will of God. Those who are approved of or acceptable to God. Can I ask you? Let's start this side. Are you approved of God? Are you accepted by God? Can I ask you on this side? Are you approved of God? Are you accepted of God? Do you know it? Do you know how we're approved of God? Because the Holy Ghost drew us to the cross. Because the Holy Ghost quickened us from our deathly deadness. And the Holy Ghost showed us the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore away our sin in his own body on the tree, the one who shed his blood. And we said, the Christ's blood is enough for me, and I repent of all my sin. And he washed me by faith in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> oh, righteous in Christ. And I'm going to go into life eternal. There's some that won't. There's some here tonight that won't. Don't go there, please. This undying worm, unquenchable fire, everlasting punishment, and an evil demonic company, or life eternal with Christ. Which one do you, would you like? <laughs> I know which one I want. And I know which I have. And listen to an old Puritan called John Trapp. This is marvelous. Listen to what he says. And I'll quote him. The devil and the damned have punishment without pity. Misery without mercy. Sorrow without succor. Crying without comfort, mischief without measure, torments without end, and past imagination. I love that simple question that the Philippian jailers cried unto Paul. Sirs, cried with a heart of fear. Fear of what would happen to them. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I love the retort. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. That's salvation. Believe on him. I'm going to close in a moment, but my closing point's as long as the other two. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 4. <clears throat> Here's my company because I'm trusting in the blood of Christ, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You're not going to sit watching your loved one waste away with cancer. You're not going to sit and watch your loved one die from complications of diabetes or tumors, whether in the head or the brain or anywhere else. You're not going to hear of heart attacks taking away your loved ones. Death is finished. And we are living an eternal life in Christ. 
What company to have. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Revelation chapter 22, please, and verse 3. For time's sake, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of, throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. There's my company gathered around the throne, worshiping the Lamb of God, singing praises unto him. And his servants shall serve him. We're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, Christian, you better get into practice now if you're not doing anything for the Lord. Because if you can't serve him here, you're certainly not going to be serving him there. Get into service for Christ. Notice verse 4. This is the most favorite bit. Verse 4. And they shall see his face. Hallelujah. They shall. I'm going to see his face. I'm going to see the face of Christ. I'm going to see the face of the one who died for me. I'm going to see the face of my Savior. I'm going to see the beautiful Son of God in all his radiant glory, beauty, and majesty. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, you're not going to have Jesus written across here. It means his word, his doctrine, the love of Christ and his commandments are in our heads are in our minds when we serve him in love. Uh, notice, and there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. And forever. So verse 6, Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he, Notice, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's at the second coming of Christ. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Then is this lake of fire. For here's what I want you to see. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That is the resurrection of those who are saved by sovereign grace and washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's the first resurrection at the coming of Christ. So we are blessed. We're called holy. But notice the second death hath no power. Underline the word power there. See the word for power? It's the word exousia. Do you know what it means? Right, right, privilege, authority. Right, privilege, authority, license. Now let me read it like this. Blessed and holy is he that hath part on the, in the first resurrection on such. The second death hath no power or the second death has no right. <laughs> The second death has no privilege. The second death has no authority to claim Ken Davidson because I'm trusting in the Savior. Can you see that? There's going to be a lake of fire, a hell fire, but those of us that are saved and in Jesus, the old lake may call, but it can call, but we are in Christ. And it has no authority over the children of the living God. <laughs> we'll not be there, brothers and sisters. <laughs> we'll not be there. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb. So I finish with this. Thank you for your attention. So who's going to hell then? If Jesus tarries, we'll all go to hell as the grave. Of course we will. But hell fire. So who's going to hell then? I'm not. Are you sure, Ken? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you positive, Ken? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. How do you know, Ken? Because the Bible tells me that those who are saved and in Christ, that hell is not made for me. And it has no license to claim me. What about you, friend? All who reject the Lord Jesus Christ and his full and free and finished work on Calvary's cross. All who reject him as their only payment of their debt of sin. Brexiteer or remainer alike, it doesn't matter. Rich or poor. Big or small. Male or female. All who reject him will end up in the lake of fire. Here's what I want you to think. Thomas Brooks said, The damned shall live in, as long in hell as God himself shall live in heaven. It's not scary. The damned shall live as long in hell as God himself shall live in heaven. That's scary. If you're not saved, that's frightening. Don't go there. I know, friend, you may be coming, you'll find, boy, what about hellfire preaching? This man is just a bit too coarse. He's a bit out of order, and he's just telling us as it is. You know what? You can look at me and say that, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm telling you that because I love you. I love your soul and I don't want you to be there. I could butter you up. And I've said it, I think it was last week, buttered up people. That is those with their nice ear tickling, their buttered sermons, to butter them up, to make them feel good, tell them nice wee stories. Buttered up people will burn well in hell. But born again believers will burn as bright as the stars in heaven. Burn as bright as the stars. I trust you're safe tonight. I see it. Are you going to walk out the door tonight and go home and get into your car and say, well, that was, maybe spoke to me tonight. I knew there was something in that, but it spoke to me. But once I get out of the road, I know I'm going to forget about it. Is that going to be another night? Or is tonight going to be the night you say, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm making my calling and election sure. I'm nailing my colors to the mast. I'm coming in repentance. I'm, I, I, I'm throwing myself at the foot of the cross. Saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you'll find it there.